I have a little dog. We're live. Hi, everybody. We're just waiting for people to tune in here and for our live feed to come through here on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. There we go. We appear to be live. Well, almost live. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. We'll just allow a few more people to trickle in here. Allow a few more people to trickle in. Thank you, everybody. It's just gone 7, 701 on the East Coast. We'll allow a few more people to join us. I'm Laura Flanders. If while you're here, why don't you subscribe to our little page? Just push that little subscribe button. And if you fancy hitting the bell, you'll get notifications every time we have a new video. How great is that? So we're just waiting for another few seconds while people come on. And um, yes, we'll allow, allow people to trickle in. I think we give them at least two minutes and then we get started. I don't know about you, but I'm lucky if I'm two minutes on time. <laughs> Let's see. All right. We'll hit 702 and I will get us all started. Here we go. Here we go. All right. So I would like to welcome everybody to our live talk back following the New York City launch of the Laura Flanders show on the wonderful WNYE network, which we will hear more about. WNYE is part of the New York City media operation that you all need to know more about. There's a lot to it. And the person who's gonna tell us all about it is with us here tonight. She is the director of broadcast operations for New York City media and WNYE's stations are part of that. We are thrilled to welcome Millie Perez to our talk back tonight. Millie, thank you so much for being with us and, and thank you for the love you're showing the Laura Flanders show. It is mutual, I can assure you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> We're also joined by two of the stars of the episode that you just watched. Joseph Rodriguez is a documentary photographer. Joseph, glad to have you on the talk back. You're going to need to unmute yourself. I know you're a pictures guy. Oh, there you go. There, you Sorry. Go. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Laura. It's, it's an honor to be here with you. David Wallace is the managing director of the Economic Hardship Reporting Project. So first, I just want to start by um, encouraging anybody who might be watching who would like to um, benefit from ASL interpretation to um, use the Zoom link that has just been posted right there in the YouTube chat. For ASL interpretation, please use the Zoom link that you can see there in the YouTube chat box, um, and you'll be able to get a feed that is um, full ASL interpretation. All right. Thank you, everybody. Give you a moment to go over there if you need it. Um, let's start by reflecting on what we just saw. And, and I think that for those of us who were in the episode you just saw, David, Joseph, it takes us back a little bit um, to recall the, the, the shooting of that episode. Uh, we shot it almost a year ago now, but it seemed as timely as ever. David, any sort of reaction to thinking about that conversation now all these months later? Yeah, I would have to say that things were bad then and I, we were talking about bad situation for journalism and local journalists and independent journalists then. And to be honest, they've gotten a lot worse during COVID and a number of publications have uh, either uh, frozen their freelance budgets, um, fired staff, furloughed people. I mean, even publications like Vice that were supposedly robust um, got rid of 155 journalists. And so that's happening across our, our industry and they estimate, uh, the last time I heard, it was about 36,000 journalists have lost their jobs or, or been furloughed uh, since COVID started. I heard, I saw in one article at the Columbia Journalism Review, the term um, existential crisis for media in this moment. Is that how you're feeling 
at least at the local level, at least at the level of the reporters that you're working with, uh, David? Uh, I can tell you that at least in some sectors like the alternative weekly market, which provided uh, a lot of news on a local in, for uh, uh, local communities uh, throughout the country, uh, because they were reliant on uh, revenues from events and getting people getting together, they are crushed. Uh, they are closing down. They are disappearing, and uh, that's one sector of our market that certainly is may not come back. Yeah, uh, Joseph, what about you? Any thoughts about the changes then versus now? <laughs> it's it's gotten harder though it, it definitely has i mean i i'm on the phones every day uh, i'm calling people trying to get work um you know there was there was a time when we did you know the new york times was much more open to to stories that we wanted to sort of uh bring to the table but that's kind of dried up they have a new editor things have changed um but uh you know, most recently we did just do a story for, for Slate on, on um, a rent strike in the Bronx, which is dear to my heart. Um, but I, I'm, I'm so used to sort of this freelance life, but it's definitely gotten harder. Yeah. It, 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 there is no doubt. So. Well, let's talk, Millie, about how you're handling this situation. Clearly, there is a lot of need for public information um, that is getting out there, we should say, you know, with, without commercial underwriting or um, political bent, you provide a different kind of a platform. How do you define what it is that you do um, at uh, New York City Broadcasting? Well, is that a question? Oh, I'm sorry. No, for Millie, for Millie. I'm sorry, Millie. Yes. Okay, no problem. I think that for us has always been a great mission to bring something, some informative information and entertainment or any type of unique um, information to New Yorkers that are impacted, not only New York, but we have a unique um, sense of um, uh, this melting pot that requires information from all over the place. And I think that for us is always finding the balance of finding things that that are current that are hyper local but also happening around the the united states that's different for us than the other public stations that we share mm. our um, platform with in new york city and remind us what new york city media encompasses the mayor's office of media and entertainment we are one side of that two-handed so we are the public uh, television station that the New York City, the New York City owns, and the other side of it is the film side of um, and broad. Um, I'm sorry, film that's also on the MOM, and part of um, their job is to really bring in all the the, the big um, directors to shoot there. The big the contracts, the shooting, which I, is I, really I... struggling now. With the situations, as you could imagine, everything is on hold. And and how is the public station funded? I'm curious. WNYE does that come out of city appropriations? Part State between CPB CPB funding, some partnerships, and and city funding. So it's one thing that the city does in co in collaboration with the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. It's it's part of our public media infrastructure that I think people um, often don't really understand those great channels that they see stuff that is not what they see everywhere else. Um, where can people find WNYE ac across the boroughs, Millie? Uh, mostly on Channel 25. You could find us on Files. We are a must carry, so we are on all your local cable providers. But you could also find us over the air on 25.1. And I think that, uh, yeah, there's, we have, we also own a radio station. So um, NYC Media is lucky. We have a broadcast station and also a radio station along with a, a couple of other PEG stations. Perfect, fantastic. That's the, that's the public education network stations. There's a long history, a long proud history there that I would like to see us revive in this moment. Because, I mean, coming back to you again, David, as I said in the episode, it's both great news that you exist and kind of frustrating news that you have to exist. Um, and in this moment, how are you faring? How is the project faring? You talked about how the, some of the journalists are faring, um, but how are you doing? Election years are always hard. It's always hard to find money for independent media. 
We've been lucky. I, I would say that people recognize the economic hardship reporting project uh, it, it provides a lot of bang for the buck. So uh, we have been uh, raising funds and some foundations have come to us uh, and know that we're providing a, a real uh, important link for independent journalists today, especially now. Uh, what I'll say is that we raised $100,000 from one foundation. Uh, they came to us and we, for the first time ever, we created emergency relief grants, which we've already gone through that program and it's temporarily on hold. We've dispersed the money within three month period. We dispersed uh, all that we meant to um, of that gift. And there, they were, we weren't requiring anyone to do work uh, for the stories. We were just giving uh, basically uh, uh, band-aids uh, out to help people survive. Uh, and you know, we believe that we staved off uh, people who were facing eviction or losing their health insurance. And so we, we, you know, stepped up and we, we were glad to do it and glad this is sort of why we exist is now. Yeah. Uh, Give us a sense of some of the reporting your reporters have been doing in this period, David. Uh, COVID's been the, the primary story that we've been focusing on. So for instance, we just did uh, with the New York times and retro report, we put out a, um, uh, a wonderful film about uh, the history of eviction. Uh, you know, the, the uh, eviction uh, moratorium ends in January and uh, a lot of also uh, landlords, I'm not so sure that they've been, um, uh, uh, you know, listening to, you know, obeying the, uh, the letter of the law. So there have been evictions that have gone on uh, despite whatever the CDC has, has required. So uh, we're looking at that, for instance, we've been looking at um, uh, one of my favorite pieces was actually by Steve Brodner, the uh, wonderful political um, cartoonist and illustrator. And he looked at people who died of COVID. He did portraits in the Washington Post to people mm -hmm. who died sort of memorialization uh, of people who didn't get big obituaries. So while we all read about John Prine, um, we didn't read about the retiree who was on Omaha Beach, who survived Omaha Beach only to, to die of COVID at 96. I want to remind people, if you're looking for ASL interpretation, we've got the wonderful Brandon Case Maddox providing that in the Zoom room that you can find the link to right there in the chat. Um, so if you need the ASL or want to check out the ASL interpretation, Brandon does a gorgeous job. Brandon Case and Maddox is doing that to ASL interpretation. The link is right there in the chat. We've got a couple of questions. Um, one from Rory. Joe, you have a new book coming out. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yes. Uh um, taxi uh, is uh, journey through my windows. Um, uh, basically, was a taxi driver from 1997. I just put up the link in the chat room for the story that that David uh, that EHRP just put together about about evictions. Uh, it's there a fantastic is. piece that I sh that you folks should take a look at when you get a minute. Um, taxi. Well, I'm just a blue collar guy who just drove a cab from 1977 to 1987 and. It was a fantastic journey to be a photographer as, as I was going to school. And uh, it's, it's just one of those New York City um, human sort of looks at our five boroughs, basically. I was one of those cab drivers. I went everywhere. South Bronx. Um, I don't care what color you were, what, where you were from. Um, I just... Uh, Really? So, let, so let me ask you about that, Joseph. I mean, yeah. we're going to go back to that New York Times piece, which was so powerful, I think, and a classic sure. kind of Laura Flanders show type of story in the sense that your your story talked also about some models that exist out there that might make a difference. We'll get to that. But before we do, there are some people talking about New York City now uh, through a rather rosy tinted gl uh, glasses of the past saying, well, it's going back to the kind of rough and ready, exciting time that we had in the seventies and eighties. Um, we had 2000 murders a year in, in, in the eighties. It was tough. If, if, if I, if I can just you know, add to the, add to that. Yeah. Folks, you know, it was no rosy time. Okay, yeah. folks. I mean, we had, we had mayor beam. We, we had, that was our mayor. The city just was almost in default. 
the municipal unions were on the street. People were being laid off. The garbage wasn't getting picked up. Crime was definitely there. It's been around for, you know, look is what crime is right now, you know? So, but there was just a lot of also other things that were going on. I mean, you know, the streets were lovely. I mean, you could see 42nd street was that kind of street. There was a lot of sex workers out there in the public. Um, people, pre -Disney, it, was, it was just a different time. Yeah, yeah, no, it definitely. It, it was exciting. There's no doubt. It was definitely exciting. I mean, if you really want to see it, go look at Boardwalk Empire. But it, it's it's there was just a lot of a lot of issues. I mean, the people that I talk with in my taxi cab, you know, were struggling. There's one photograph, for example, of, of a fellow taxi driver in, in, in the book. Right. It's African-American brother who's reading Ebony magazine. This is 1987. He's reading Ebony magazine about what the African-American population looked like in the year 2000. That's the cover story. You'll see him reading that. And and so we talked a lot about the future, but also about the present and how we wanted to change the city. But it seemed to go in such a, a Disneyland way that, you know, yeah, even even now when you walk up and down Broadway, it's just not the same Broadway. Yeah. Um, when I think of... When David? When I think of New York City, I grew up, uh, I'm a native Manhattanite uh, and grew up in the 70s in the city. And, it, you know, there were definitely some wonderful things, but I had 35 kids in my classroom. And now my son, who is in the New York City Public School, has 25. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's progress. Um, de Blasio, for all his faults, let's look at some two things that he, he did that he will be remembered for. Uh, he lowered the price, did a, um, an income-based uh, transit pass, right? Where if you're uh, uh, low income, you can now get a 50% or free uh, transit pass. That's amazing. And that changes people's lives in a profound way. And even a, a bigger uh, advanced advancement, I think, that he, he made was when he first, in the first term, you know, pre-K, uh, all day pre-K uh, that is free and in every school. If he does nothing else, de Blasio will be, be, will be remembered mm -hmm. for helping low-income people, uh, you know, have a, a full day daycare in New York City schools. Now, obviously with COVID, a lot is shot to hell, but um, uh, hopefully that will one day go and, and, and we can take pride that the city ha has taken care of low-income people better than it did. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. There's a question from YouTube from Emily Slatko. We're at a point in history where people don't want to return to the old way of doing things because those systems have failed us. My question is, what does a radically new American dream look like? Um, I'm going to throw that back to you, Joseph, and then Millie. I, I think there's a, a part of that picture that has to do with media looking different. And, and I'd love your thoughts on that. But but Joseph, do you have your your favorite vision quest you want to share with us? Oh, that's, I think, to answer that question, I, I, it's a little tricky for me, because it's it's really about class and how the city is moved. You know, I mean, there, there, you know, I live in a very nice neighborhood here, Park Slope. And there's still issues of the police and this, and I know they're important, you know, I, I, I really do, I honor them, but um, they, I, I don't know, there's just, a, there's just a lot. I don't think it's as rosy as, as I'd like to sort of see where, I mean, I, would, I want the city to change, yeah. of course. I mean, I love us to be inclusive. It's a very humane city and it's great, but, but we got a lot of fixing up to do before we can uh, sort of get to that point where I feel I can celebrate. You know, I can I can say to you, yeah. oh, this is this is great, and school's great, and you know what, what David Bruce brought in was is it talked about the pre-K. You know, I can tell you that I know ten families, ten families, and at different classes, not necessarily all just restaurant workers or you know immigrant folks. You know, it changed their life, literally. And in that way, I think that's a real positive bump up because, you know, I could see when, when parents are happy or, and feel calmer and feel safer and feel like their kids are, that's a huge big thing because that's the next generation coming up. But, you know, I, I, 
I, well, I just I'm, I'm always out there to do some more work. That's that's all. So I, I mean, the I, COVID I crisis has changed life for a lot of people, obviously. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But at the economic level, we're reading, I don't know how many of you saw the piece in the Washington Post yesterday, you know, we're reading that for wealthy America, it, recovery is basically here. Um, and that we have never seen as unequal a recession as the one that we're going through right now. I mean, Millie, I wanted to come to you about your sense of, are you in pursuit of programming that addresses new visions, new solutions? Because I think Emily, who asked the questions right, I know we at the Laura Flanders Show believe a lot of systems are broken and we need to remake them better. We find that there is a huge struggle now. All productions are on hold. There's no money. We're trying to figure out how producers will bring us innovative and creative ways to shed light on their stories with no funding, no real platforms for them. And for us, something like your show in particular helps us bridge that gap where you are still providing these relevant um, storylines that are so right on point and on key to what's happening now. And I think that it's going to be hard and it's going to continue to be hard for the next, um, I guess, for the rest of the year, because people are, even when you are, um, the sensitivity and the shelf life of something now is shorter and shorter since things are changing so rapidly. So these new look are like Zoom meetings and these are the new productions that are now available. Now you have to realize that there's not a lot of people funding that. For us, we really, we are owned by the city, so our budget is pretty tight. So we really bank on partnerships that we could support by putting them on air and not necessarily funding them with money. So we try to find, talk to our producers and trying to get them, uh, trying to get them a, a simpler way to, to bring, light to their stories without losing any of the efforts because a lot of them have already put a lot of money in production but have nowhere to put it since they can't complete it the projects mm -hmm. so we're looking um, right now is a lot of the conversations that we have with with local producers that had started something earlier in the year and now didn't know how to complete it or how to what what the finishing touches will be since they now are so different than how the project started. Yeah, right. Now suddenly we're making our TV show with cell phones or right. <laughs> through Zoom or whatever it is. David, do you have a vision of how we will come out of this or will we come out of this? Um, well, yeah, we'll come out of it. Dif differently, differently, better. I mean, well, the levels of inequality we're looking at are dramatic. Right. I haven't seen right. anything like yeah. these charts. Yeah, well, well, what's the f one way that we can try and change the way people think about people, our neighbors who might be poorer than us, or uh, one of the ways, you know, around 40% of Americans now uh, blame uh, low-income people for their, their, their financial situation. And I think that's gone up, I would tend to guess, in during the last four years, I would imagine. Uh, so I'm hoping that by what we do at the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, by telling people stories about that your neighbors are struggling and here's why. And that might be a reporter talking about his own eviction, or we had a reporter recently talk about her um, participation in what is called a Christian health share, uh, which didn't provide her uh, the coverage that she needed when she had cancer or a cancer scare. Um, there are, we're hoping that we can make a change and uh, alter the, you know, make people more um, thoughtful and caring about their neighbors. I know mm. that may sound a little bit uh, um, uh, uh, idealistic, but yeah. that's what we hope to do by telling these stories. So, but I, I am encouraged that um, through, through all the, 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 this disaster, this, this pandemic, um, there are also some amazing stories about people who are helping each other and they get, tend to get short shrift. And uh, it also, it shouldn't be that, that, that people, that foundations and nonprofits and, and mutual aid societies are 
you know, holding up and knitting the safety net. There should be a safety net, right? The government, that's one thing that government should do is there should be a, a safety net. And that's, I think that COVID makes it clearer to people in weirdly a positive way that there's this unintended um, consequence of COVID, which is people I think are more aware of the struggle that their neighbors are, are yeah. facing. Well, first we have to conquer racism and of course sexism and colonialism for us to actually kind of have empathy and some belief in universal human life value. Uh, and some of the questions that we're getting on YouTube address that. How do we make media more inclusive? How do we make media less racist? Um, I think part of what we are in a struggle about right now, I looked at the, the presidential debate, so-called at, at the weekend and or on Tuesday and thought, you know, the fundamental, the, the most important message coming out of the Trump performance was you don't matter. The democracy doesn't matter. You don't matter. Um, there's nothing you can do. The whole event felt to me like a discouragement of anyone getting involved in, in their democracy. And for whatever else you may think of what got said there that night. Um, I think the mission of a program like ours is both to in, you know, both to inform people about the struggles that their neighbors are having, but also to inform people about the insights and in ingenuity that their neighbors have um, and some of the solutions that people are coming up with in their community. Um, like you talked about in the episode, in the, in the story, in the show, we just showed Joseph, you know, let's tell the full picture of people's lives. Uh, and, and out of that may come, I think in the 1930s, they referred to the laboratories of democracy, which was the way that people with no services, with no rights, with no food, no health care, no housing, figured out how to survive that depression uh, through mutual aid, through credit unions, through land trusts, through cooperatives. Um, and those became some of them the core pillars of the New Deal when, when politics changed. I'm hoping, I don't like the word hope attack particularly, but my, my vision of the future that I prefer is that politics changes and some of the kinds of models that we report on on the show um, and that you will help us to read the report on or broadcast, thank you, Millie, um, are the kinds of models that could be the pillars of our, our rebuilding of a better structure. Uh, because it seems clear that if nothing else we've learned from COVID that our systems are broken. Um, of of politics, of economics, of healthcare, you name it, um, we're seeing it. Um, so could, we've, we've called um, my my colleague, uh, executive director of the support, has called for a federal uh, and state level uh, writers project, which was a New Deal uh, era uh, project, which funded uh, journalism and uh, uh, photography, and we are hoping that that is something that if it doesn't even happen on the, the federal level that maybe some states will experiment as in this lab that you're discussing. Uh, that's one way that I think um, the market hasn't proven uh, a, a it's, been, it's been a little a little hostile unless you're Sinclair and uh, or, or a large uh, conglomerate. So we're certainly hoping that there's uh, there's a change of coming. Yeah. Well, we have a if I can if I can just yeah. if Joseph, I can just Joseph. add. Uh, I mean, I have to say that s since COVID, I could see with my students, I could see with past students. I, I see I see these storytellers now more active with no money, no no money. I mean, the the, the advantage they have they have a digital camera. It's actually better. It's cheaper to to work with a still camera than it would be a a big production film uh, production. But they're out there. I mean, I can, I can give you 20 people right now, 20 young people, that's the next generation that are out there, you know, looking at, you know, our, our country, right? And the issues of our country, bringing us together. This is, this is my, my whole, I'm very optimistic about photography and what it can do, right? Okay, we need the platforms. That's what we're talking about. It's, it, they're very small, but we, you know, God willing, we still got the web and we can still put things out there. And I, I know photographers that are telling stories on the walls of New York City. They're going out doing wheat pasting back like they did in the 1930s. So, so Millie, I, I can see you, you, you nodding your head, Millie, in, in agreement. You want to weigh in here? Oh, you're, you're muted. Here there I you am. go. <laughs> 
I think that I completely agree with Joseph. I think that um, the young um, generation now have this beautiful platform where they could just put stuff and really engage in a, in a way that they never had that before. It was always so strict and part of, or um, it's really hard to get it back in my realm of things like on the TV side, because some of these projects are great for website and for different um, platforms, not so much for public TV, but I do see the engagement is certainly, is beautiful to see it. Um, they're much younger. And I think a lot of times, especially when it comes to, to hard um, conversations are usually held by older people. Now you see people that are 18, 17, 18, really involved in a, in a way that they haven't before. So it's nice. I think it's, it, it has to do also with, with the fact that they have a platform. They could go to YouTube. They, have, they, they really don't have that, that filter where most of us had that growing up, mm. right? They, they feel something, they kind of put it up there. They feel strongly about something and they could follow it through. Do you ever <laughs> think that there might not be a need for public television, television per se, going forward? Because I know we thought long and hard about whether to invest in, in making a show of the quality that you have to make to get onto broadcast TV. I think that people still like to, it, there's so much to go through unless you have a particular show online that you want to watch or listen to. It really, um, a platform like TV still allows you to, find place that are that you know that you could enjoy for us in particular public television station is a place that you could tune in with your family everybody could learn together everybody could sit down together where we are in different silos now when you're looking in the website or if you're streaming you'll get the the one member that'll watch while on broadcast if you're lucky you'll have a whole family sharing that platform and they could have conversations around that do you do that in your house millie we do we do i think that it's the only the the old it keeps resonating some t one time um once upon a time somebody told me a long time ago that pbs um how they survived for so long is that it was a multi-generational um, watch. So you had the children, the parents and the grandparents watching at, um, at once. So you always had three generations already um, viewers. Yeah. Um, so it was a package of three generations in one. And I still believe that yeah. that holds true now. And during COVID, I think so more so because people started to watch TV together again. Their, their bandwidth perhaps couldn't take everybody being on yeah, different exactly. streams. Um, you know, but I have to I have to just remind us a little bit. And I, we've got a bunch of questions and I, I want to answer them. Um, but a lot of them has to do with how do we support the programming that we're that we're making each one of us and together. Uh, but while we're talking about platforms and, and I'll get to how we support our programming in just a second. Basically, it's you, our viewers and listeners, with the help of a bunch of um, foundations. But if you really want to support programming that you care about, you have to support it. Uh, you have to put some money where your mouth is. And I appreciate everybody that's done that to help us uh, get to where we are. If you want to help the Laura Flanders show, you go to lauraflanders.org, click the donate button, um, ideally become one of our Patreon partners. Um, that's my commercial push for support for the Laura Flanders show. You'll hear it again before the end of our talk back. But I do want to recall how we ever ended up with public television and public radio. Uh, and it came out of a moment, not unlike this one, where you had um, a financial crisis coming out of the depression. You had the rise of a populist right wing movement. You had the rise of a civil rights movement. Um, and the airwaves that were in the hands of private broadcasters were kind of up for grabs of, of, of who could get the loudest voice. And you had some pretty racist and sort of fascist friendly broadcasters dominating the airwaves in lots of places. And it was only because legislators in the New Deal era said, whoa, wait a minute, um, we're going to have to create a space where it's not just market driven programming, but programming that is for the public good, for the public interest. It was only because of that moment uh, that we ended up with what is now the public television service and what is now public radio uh, came out of that same tradition. 
if we don't act right now, it seems to me, to protect some parts of our media ecosystem, uh, we are in a situation where one of our questioners online raised a very good point. Like, how do we balance the desire to give people information that they need for a smart democracy with the stuff that will get lots of likes and ratings and viewers and bring in the advertising dollars? Um, it's it's a challenge. I know on commercial r television, you walk out of the studio, they tell you what your ratings were that night. So if you didn't follow the latest antics of our president, for example, um, you probably lost some viewers. The programming like ours depends on there being an appetite for something different. And thank heaven, some places in the media that will uh, broadcast it. Um, but Joseph, you must know there's probably a big market for you to go and do the what bleeds leads pro, um, photographs. Oh, of course, absolutely. I mean, I've been I've been hitting the editor's doors with that issue for a long time. But you know, I, I want to just bring back a little history, New York history here. In the 1930s, when we had so many immigrants in our in our city, mostly from Eastern Europe, you know, they all didn't have any work, and and quite a few of them had a, a camera in their hand, and they went out and they they built this, this platform called the Photo League, which was really amazing. And you had all these immigrant photographers photographing New York. And, I, and it was just so uplifting in a way, you know, all communities. And I think we're kind of in that space now where I could always see my, my ex-students at NYU. I saw it 9-11, how we all came together as a city. Um, and and I, I still have believe in the power of the camera and what we can do with it. And we don't necessarily need a lot of money to be able to make to make these stories come out. And and Instagram, I could see it right now. I'm, I'm just publishing, uh, putting out these pictures that I did in Katrina back in 2005, 2006. And and it's really starting to cause a lot of chatter and kids are really talking about it. It's their history. And and so I, I, I think but that's no money. That's of yeah, I was going to say, paid, I mean, David, but, that's but, that's nice, David, but that's not money for that. Right, this is a right. moment where a lot of people can get their voice out, but getting paid for it seems harder than ever. Well, uh, that's where nonprofit journalism and foundations uh, have to step in and step up. Uh, so uh, we are seeing there was a time that foundations uh, and philanthropists were, were nervous of investing in media. That has changed somewhat, not entirely. So uh, there really have to be, at this point, uh, foundations really have to uh, ante up and they should be investing not only in organizations like ours and, and your show, but beyond that, they should be figuring out how to buy television stations, uh, uh, local affiliate television stations. And uh, from the, you know, instead of ceding it to Sinclair and there should be a focus on quality journalism. That's not about uh, if it bleeds, it leads. And I just wanna say we invested with Lilly Broadcasting in Erie, Pennsylvania. We helped work, we, we it was a, a family owned station an affiliate, an NBC affiliate in Erie, uh, which is, a, you know, a sort of depressed community. It's, you know, it's, it's definitely had its struggles. And we are funding a poverty reporter, uh, a poverty and inequality reporter, who's not doing If It Bleeds, It Leads. And you know what? It's proving popular. Uh, it's getting, it's gaining a viewership. And we're it's a very small pilot project, but we're hoping to replicate it. Yeah, I should say if you want to support independent programming like ours, and ours is a nonprofit organization, um, not a for-profit media operation, you go to lauraflanders.org forward slash donate. And if you want more information on how you can support the work of the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, you just go to economichardship.org and follow the links. Um, Millie, to you, what, what do you think of this idea of individuals, if they have the resources or if they can pool the resources, purchasing some of these local stations that are out there that otherwise might go to the hands of the right? We don't see it happen very much, except on the right-hand side of the political spectrum. Um, I th Thankfully, the public um, licenses are are 
hard to to just switch over and I think that it it would be I personally find it and make it an obligation to keep that balance I would hate to see if if stations do not get the funding that they need that uh that will strike uh, an off balance to what's currently out there. I, I see a lot of stations that are public television stations that are no longer PBS station. Like we are not a PBS station. We are a public television station without a PBS license. There's a lot of um, funding issues that had has transfer a lot of these public stations to universities and things like that to keep that balance. But I think that as the money keeps shrinking, it's gonna be quite inter uh, interesting how it survives the next 20 years. Yeah, I mean, there was a story not so long ago, we did it on the show that New Jersey, I believe, sold one of its public television stations. I think it might've been in the Newark Chris area. Administration. Wasn't that right, David? Chris Christie administration. Exactly. And they said it was well, so they could better fund the revive the, the surviving stations. But that was one less station um, in public hands, if I recall correctly. Yeah, it's, it's going to ours uh, be we are on the city and we're always cautious about like what would happen if the city no longer had the station because we really have that that balance that's not I shedding light i think that for us is really important to bring stories not only that is important to a particular group or person but if somebody else that's not necessarily interested in that story could catch something could learn something and could keep it along i think to us that mission is so important so i i i think that cities a lot of the cities have also learned that when they have given up their public license they have suffered and then it's been it's too late to reacquire it and we've seen that happening for us in our station alone in the 80s it's gone back and forth where the city wanted to sell part of it or we've gotten it back and forth we were owned by the department of education for a long time until 2005 where it became uh, part of the city owned by the city so it's it's had its struggle but uh, for us in New York City, they have always recognized how important it is to keep it in the hands of New York. And how can we help? Is there something we can do to help strengthen what you're doing, Millie? Keep sending us programming like you are. I think that <laughs> I love to find programming that's available to me that sheds a new light that's not just a cooking show. I like those too. However, I like to find programs that are current. It's really hard to find a balance of programming that's um, informative, but also current. There's going to have to be a soup kitchen, uh, a soup kitchen TV show in the, in the future, probably. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> yeah, you, you're not. You, you're chuckling, but I'm afraid this is the case. Um, Dark humor is the only thing that keeps me going in life. <laughs> oh no, it's true. I, I, hear you. <laughs> I do want to bring us back. I mean, I think so much of this goes back to you know you you what do they say you you treasure what you measure you know um if we don't figure out how to tackle racism <laughs> in our media culture and change who we think matters and whose story matters we're not going to get any of the sorts of changes that we're talking about and cherish the kind of public resources that we created decades ago in the 1930s primarily for white people. Um, that seems to be the challenge of this moment. Like how do we actually unpack the relationship between our economy driven by inequality and private accrual of wealth and public work and social work? Um, if we don't tackle the relationship between that and our racial hierarchies, I don't see how we move forward. So in this moment where so much is up for grabs and so much is on the table, I'm curious, you know, what sort of stories are, are, are you looking for, David? What sort of things are you shooting, uh, Joseph? And what kind of changes do you think we can make even in our good public media outlets, Millie? But start with you, David. We're, we're always looking for story pitches uh, by 
experienced uh, independent journalists, um, and we certainly stress diversity uh, as we recruit and work very hard at uh, finding stories by um, people of color. And so we're, we're always looking and very open. And I'd, I'd have to say that um, we need to do better. Even on, from our, we, about a third of our grantees are uh, people of color and we can do better than that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're striving. And so I think acknowledging that is part of the battle. Um, and, and it's important to just be honest about, about these types of issues. And uh, I don't, you know, often I feel when I'm around uh, edit, the decision-making editors, uh, the high level editors who I meet, um, there's very little, there's not as much diversity as we even might think. There's, it's really, really too lily white. And it does seem it's not just who's doing the reporting, but what sort of stories are being reported? What questions are being asked? Um, Joseph, what's well, on your plate? I, I, I mean, <laughs> oh my goodness. You want me, do you want to talk about, <laughs> you want to talk about my life, basically. I've been, been working on stories pretty much solo for so long, working with big media outlets until they dried up. But one in particular is Migrantes. I mean, I, me and this writer who I work very closely with, Ruben Martinez, who's also a fantastic journalist, and we've worked together for EHRP. We did a revisit on the gangs. You, you talked about this on your, the show, on your right? episode. We followed Mexican migrants from Michoacan for 10 years in the United States of America. We crossed the border with them. We went to California. We followed them as they picked our strawberries. We followed them as they went, did restaurant work in, 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 in uh, Arizona. All the way, and, and Arkansas, tomatoes, uh, you know, the whole migrant trail, the whole thing, and the meatpacking plants and all, all of this. 10 years of work, 560 photographs done. It will be a book eventually. But what we looked for was, first of all, to judge change the conversation, which we have been hearing now for some years now about, you know, the other being the enemy, the other being stealing my jobs and all these things. And, and we just watched families sit down and eat dinner after working 14 hours a day, picking our, or getting our, our broccoli ready for Whole Foods. I mean, and working 126 degrees, you know, but what, what I try to do with the camera is just bring humanity together. Mm -hmm. Because I think if we, if we, I know we talk about race, but you know, we're all the same. And so when you start to see, I've, I've heard this from conservatives really in Texas, uh, real, real, real Republican guys and said, you know, wow, I didn't really understand that, you know, that he had six kids and he came home from work and then, and they cook dinner and they go to school and, and, and meanwhile, they're paying their taxes. Meanwhile, they're giving something to our country they're making, they're picking our food, which is work, work, dealing with Mexican migrants that, that work the, the farms. And, you know, it's the 1930s. It's, yeah. it, they were white then, now they're brown. And, you know, all right, take them away. We did one story in the book project, A Day Without a Mexican. That was in 2006 when all Latinos came out and did not work that day. And oh my goodness, it was really amazing to watch the French restaurant and the Italian restaurant here in New York City and, and the owners have to come in and cook. And, you know, you take these people away. <laughs> I'm sorry, buddy. You're, they're just, the country's not going to work. Yeah. So, so my job is to try to humanize these people and show them as not necessarily a bunch of criminals, but, you know, fathers and families and work real hard. So. We're also looking for stories about voting suppression. Uh, and so we're very interested uh, in um, finding, you know, hearing about people's stories about how they're trying to vote and if they're struggling, uh, we'd like to know. Yeah. And we'd like to pay attention to that and uh, invest in coverage of that. I guess we have to go to Texas right now, right? I just, I just read the story an hour ago. They're just cutting, taking away these these kind of booths or boxes where we can put our mail-in ballots in and so making it harder and harder for folks to, I, I think that's the story of the time right now. I mean, is COVID going on and all this stuff, but the, these voting, I mean, really it's, it's, whew, my God, 
this is like so important for us. Well, that's another service that you provide at in at MYE. I think Millie is giving people some kind of election basic information. We have. We are. We also have a municipal station, and that one we have. Um, whether it's local pro um, elections, we do the electoral. Uh, so we have highlights of all the candidates so that people could become confident that they're voting for the right people, not just a name that they think they know. So we've um, done the video voter guide, that sort of thing. And for us, it's always a challenge because we always have to make sure that everything is uh, balanced and equal so that we have coverage on both sides and all sides. But once, um, when they are available to us, a lot of those projects are partnerships, not things that we are currently doing ourselves only. We love to shed light and bring that information because a lot of our, we strive in, in that type of stuff, bringing information to New York City, to New Yorkers about what's happening in the city, especially local elections. Well, I just want to thank you all. And Millie, especially to you, it's a pleasure to be able to bring you out from behind the scenes there. Millie is the Director of Broadcast Operations at NYC Media. Um, and to celebrate a little bit this ecosystem that is displayed here on your on your live chat see, screen, where we have some of the journalists, some of the hosts, some of the platforms represented, just a few on this occasion. Um, we'll do this more, but I just want to reiterate for people that are watching or maybe listening, um, we're dependent on independent media in ways that we're not even conscious of uh, as a democracy, as a society. I had an old friend who said it's the independent media that bring issues to the boil and it's the mainstream that inhales the steam. So everything that you can do to support independent media like mine, like the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, and to push back on any challenge to uh, publicly owned and municipally owned stations uh, like WNYE, please do it, people. And if you haven't yet become a Patreon partner of the Laura Flanders Show, or if you haven't yet donated, hop on over there to our website, lauraflanders.org, uh, become a supporter, become a subscriber, uh, and support us in whatever way is comfortable for you, but be there on a regular basis. If you can make a contribution of $2, $3, $4 a month, it really does make a difference. So thank you. We will be on the air every week on WNYE on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can find more information about the channels that we're on all across the country at our website. We have a nifty little search mechanism where you just put in your zip code and up will pop your local station. Um, we thank you for joining us. We'll do this again. Thank you all of you for being on the show, for being supporters of the show and for the, the work that you do. David, keep it up. Uh, Joseph, Millie, thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you all. You too. And please, folks, please, money. We, Laura <laughs> Flanders needs money. Sorry, I'm the guy with the tin cup on Broadway and 42nd Street. Okay, I will wear that big sign. Okay, you need your RP. Uh, I, okay. I appreciate that. I appreciate Always. it. Thank Gotta you. Got to put that plug in there. Love you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Are we all off?